One of the most important things that you can develop in your life, in your relationship, is your resilience, your ability to bounce back no matter how challenging things get, and to bounce back in a way that leaves you stronger, more connected with your partner, and more inspired for whatever is going to come next. And that is all going to be the focus of today's episode with Dr. Peter Levine. But first, the Relationship Alive podcast is an offering to you to help you have the most amazing relationship possible. So if you're finding the show to be useful, please consider a donation to support us and ensure that we can continue. In order to choose something that feels right for you, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week, I would like to thank Ryan, Madeline, Nina, and Laura for your generous contributions. Thank you so much for your vote of confidence in Relationship Alive. And the things that Peter and I are going to be talking about today require a lot of great communication with your partner. If you haven't picked it up yet, please grab my free guide, to my top three relationship communication secrets. These are the kinds of things that will help you stay connected, no matter how challenging the thing is that you're trying to talk about. And if you're talking about amazing stuff, then your conversations will be that much more amazing. So in order to grab this free guide, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And finally, if you haven't joined us yet and you're on Facebook, please find and join the Relationship Alive community. Right now we have over 1,100 members who are there to support each other in having conscious, thriving, growth-oriented relationships. And it's such a fantastic supportive community. So I hope to see you there. All right. I think that's it. It's time to get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. How do you foster resiliency in yourself and in your partner? And if you have kids, in your kids. When it comes to relationship and how we are in the world, there's perhaps nothing as important as how resilient we are. Because let's face it, life sometimes sends problems our way or things that are challenging. And if you're expecting everything to be a cakewalk, then it's, life is going to be really hard for you. And on the flip side, if when things go wrong, you think, oh my God, goodness, this is, it's over now, um, then things are also going to be hard for you. So in order to get through anything that happens to you and come out the other side stronger and more vibrant and to bring that same quality into your relationship and to bring that same quality to, if you have kids in your life, the way that they respond to the world. That is what we are going to talk about today. And in order to do so, we have brought back one of our most esteemed guests to the Relationship Alive podcast. His name is Dr. Peter Levine, and he is one of the world's experts on how to heal from trauma. He was first on the show back in episode 29, and if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to neilsatin.com slash trauma, and you can hear all about how to heal your triggers and trauma in relationship. And we're not going to cover much of that material. We're going to try to cover new ground here. So I invite you to listen to episode 29. In the meantime, it's not a prerequisite for today's conversation. And we are going to dive deep on the topic of resiliency. So if you want a transcript and guide for this episode, you can visit neilsatin.com slash Levine, as in Peter Levine. And that's spelled L-E-V-I-N-E. Or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and I will send you a link where you can download that show guide and transcript. In the meantime, P 
Peter Levine, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you back here on Relationship Alive. Thank you. It's good to be back. I enjoyed the last time. Well, it's uh, always exciting to be able to chat with you and and you are someone who has been on the forefront of figuring out how we heal the things that keep us stuck. Yeah. And there's nothing that that um I think defines resilience more than the ability to get unstuck when you're going through something. Indeed, I like that. That's I think that's right on it. It's about when we get stuck Uh, somehow knowing we can handle it because of an inner sense in our bodies, in our organism, and that we can also receive and give support at times that are really challenging. Yeah, and I'm I'm inspired by, in uh, your book, Trauma and Memory, Brain and Body in a Search for the Living Past, which I happen to have here right in front of me, you talk about this location in the brain where resides our capacity for uh, wanting to persevere through Mm. adversity. Wow. You obviously have actually read it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is central to, to healing from trauma and also for being able to stay in a supported, intimate relationship. Um, You know, uh, there amazingly are areas in the brain, specific areas that appear literally to be involved with the will to persevere in the face of significant obstacles. I mean, if you think about it, it it makes sense uh, because we wouldn't have been able to survive as a species if we didn't have that capacity. And I don't say it's the same as resilience, but it's a big, important component of resilience. And, and you know, in working with people who have been traumatized for 45 years, uh, and I think back on it, I think really my job is to help them enlist that capacity, connect to that capacity, and by doing that, being able to move forward in in difficult times. But it, I think they're very closely related, this will to persevere and and resilience. I also see resilience as an autonomic exercise. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we're in states of fear, uh, our autonomic nervous system gets activated in particular ways. And that really affects our whole perception of the world and our cognition, really, because it's a strong, it's the foundation for many other, for many perceptions. And if we're able to experience ourselves, for example, our heart rate increasing and then experiencing it decreasing, we're doing an autonomic exercise. And this is something that couples can do with each other by just being present when one of the, uh, when, when one of the, the, the members um, is feeling uh, um, frightened is okay so and what happens now and what happens next and is there anything about that is there anything else about that so to be there with a person to help them move through the stuck places is a great gift and i really believe that in one way or another most maybe even all successful couples um, have some degree of this capacity. Yeah, and in the interest of, of increasing that and, and maybe even uh, getting a little bit more detail about what you were just mentioning, I'm, I'm thinking now, um, because I, as I mentioned before we jumped on the interview, I just read uh, your amazing book, Trauma Proofing Your Kids, mm. um, A Parent's Guide for Instilling Confidence, Joy, and Resilience. And one of the things that I loved about the book was not only um, 
feeling way more resourced in terms of how I show up for my own children. Mm. But also you stress the importance for parents of being able to understand the language of the body yeah. um, so that you can have those communications with your children and help them understand the language of the body. But one thing I'd love for you to talk about is how there's this way of communicating about sensation that is how these deeper parts of our brain actually perceive the world that that's not about because I think the temptation of if I were sitting with my partner would be you know if I was saying and what's next and what happens next would be sort of in this you know caught in this zoo of thoughts and feelings yeah and and I love bringing it down to the to the deeper level of sensation so can you talk a little bit about that and why it's so important to develop a vocabulary around sensation in your body yeah for sure um all of our emotions have sensation-based components. Indeed, many emotions, particularly difficult emotions, are a combination of physical sensations and c cognitive thoughts or beliefs. And together, they drive an emotional state such as fear or rage. And if we are able to become aware of the sensations that actually underlie those emotions, then we are able to allow the sensations to change, to transform, and doing, and also noticing the thoughts that are involved. And doing that has the sometimes miraculous way to actually change our emotions because one of the things about difficult emotions so-called negative emotions is they just have a tendency to, to keep going and keep going as much as we can understand them or understand our thoughts about them where really it's difficult to change them and I really believe my experience is that Again, the way that we can change, the one of the ways that we can change these difficult emotions is by, al by the alchemy of working with the sensations, the underlying sensations, and also sensations of goodness. You know, in, in, in my, my major book, In an Unspoken Voice, How the Body Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness, the key is in both. And restoring goodness also is a sensation, a feeling, a felt sense sensation of, of resilience. Yes, I, when I you, say goodness, I, I, I don't mean like, you know, a good child, a good spouse, a good and so forth and so on. <laughs> I mean more the, the Buddhistic understanding of goodness, that it's a feeling of wholeness. And a feeling like this, like wholeness are some of the most important antidotes, again, for these difficult emotions and sensations that allow us to move through them because we have this innate capacity to heal. Originally, I studied this in animals and how they rebound in the aftermath of predation, of prey animals and predation. But it's led me to a more general understanding that there is this profound instinct, similar to the instinct to persevere, and they're related, I'm sure, to heal, that we yearn healing. And in a way, you know, in relationships, I'm sure as you and many of your speakers have noted, that we tend to pick people with similar traumas or complementary traumas and at first you know we're very much in love which is often the first state phase of a relationship but then what happens when the stuff hits the fan how do we deal with that in a collaborative way in a corrective way and again this is so important in restoring resilience because co-regulation 
is tremendously important. I'm looking forward to it. And, and you know, uh, later this month, there, there's a big evolution of psych psychology conference in in Anaheim and I'm on a panel with Sue Johnson and you know as I I think you've interviewed Sue and, and your readers any of your readers don't know Sue is probably the leading person in understanding the emotions that go on in couples dynamics and really has a strong emphasis on co regulation. What I'm saying is that we need both co-regulation, of course, but we also need the tools for our own regulation, for our own building of, of, resist- of uh, resilience. So I, I, I see the two going, blending together, you know, very nicely. So, Taking a step back, I guess. Oh, just let me to, go back. One other thing. Yeah, go ahead. We we're talking about with our children by learning to read their bodies and they're helping them connect with their sensations. We uh, we are building a tremendous reservoir of resilience that they will and skills that they will carry through the for, for their whole lives. And again, one of the things that as parents that we need to be able to do is when there's like in the inevitable fall or God knows there, you know, the uh, ride to the emergency room, um, we need first to take care of our own sensations and emotions because children are incredible mimic- mimickers they will pick up the emotion of the parent. So, you know, anybody who's flown in an airplane in the last 25 years, they, the, the, uh, what do they call them? The cabin personnel, they make the announcement that in the event, unlikely event of a depressurization, the oxygen mask will come down. If you have a child or somebody infirm next to you, put the mask on your face first and then put the mask on the child. In other words, calm yourself first so that the children are not picking up the fear or very often the parents override the fear with anger and and they're very angry at the child. Uh, and, And again, children will pick this up. So if we learn to take care of ourselves, self regulation, we then can impart that capacity or support that developing capacity in our kids. And, you know, when I've worked with kids uh, when there's been a relatively acute trauma, you know, sometimes it just takes a few minutes of play and they go right to the place where they are stuck, stuck in their bodies. I just help them move through that and then they're off back to play again. So these tools are, are tremendously important and, and probably a, uh, uh, a quarter of the book or the eighth of the book, I guess probably, is about exercises to help the parents maintain this resilience in the face of the catastrophes that will befall the children and the parents. It's a given. I mean, kids especially when they get into the more active phase, you know, around 18 months, two years, where they're just scooting everywhere and climbing and falling and pulling flower pots down on their, on their <laughs> sweet little heads. They get terrified. But again, if we hold our own center and then help the child contain those difficult emotions and sensations, they will calm, often surprisingly quickly, sometimes in a matter of minutes. And it's for the way you support children, it's age dependent. You know, the way you support a baby who's tremendously upset is way different than the way you you support a four-year-old with a with a young child. You're going to be holding the child and rocking the child. With a four-year-old, you're going to be sitting by the child's side and maybe placing your hand, as we suggest in the book, on the child's back until the breathing reestablishes itself. The spontaneous breathing reestablishes itself. And the amazing thing, I think, the 
the side effect of this is that kids start doing it for themselves. And many of the children that I've worked with tell me how they've done it in their school when something happens to one of the one of the students. They sit there and they they're with the student in that way. Wow. So it's it's just you know and and actually the when I was designing the cop the cover of the book with uh, North Atlantic. Um, I wanted it to be red. It has a picture of children in the middle, which is the not red, but the rest of the cover is red. And the idea, please forgive me, is uh, Mao Zedong. And the way he wanted the red book, well, he insisted that the red book, red book be in the hands of everybody in China that had his sayings. So the idea here is that every parent could have this book and could share it with other parents. And so, you know, one of the things that I think geopolitically is that when we're in a fearful state, any leader, and we've had ample evidence of this, who says there is an enemy out there, they want to attack us, they want to humiliate us, they want to take our jobs away, and I am the only person that can protect you. No names mentioned. <laughs> and that's going to that's gonna grab a lot of people. But if you're not in a fearful state, then you don't buy into that. You really think about it. So I'm hoping also that this book in the next generation will give us more, um, more c- citizens – more democratic citizens uh, allowed to, or empowered, really, to make effective action. Yeah, I, um, I mean, as I was reading the book, for one thing, I, and, and actually this brings me to a question, because um, I was reading it and I was, of course, thinking, wow, I wish I had read this when my, you know, before my kids were born. <laughs> um, right. And, um I want to fill in a gap or two, but perhaps before we do that, I'm just going to ask you this question, which is, you know, let's say my my son, he he's going to turn 11 in in a couple months. But there are things that I remember having happened with him, you know, when he was two and tumbled down the stairs and or um, you know, three or four years ago, he jumped off a swing set and ended up breaking his arm and oh. so these are these are some traumatic Mm -hmm. Um, events in his life I'm wondering and this is obviously going to have some bearing for adults as well how can I how do I know if those things are are lodged within him as trauma Uh and and if so what's a what's a way to invite him into releasing that yeah uh, well often you'll see it 11 is, you know, uh, is the age where you can really also talk to the child directly. Um, And sometimes I'll just, you know, we're sitting around and we'll say something like, you know, maybe even if we're at the top of the stairs or something like that. And I would just maybe sit down with the child and saying, gosh, I remember when you fell down these stairs when you were two years old. Do you remember anything about that? And if the child very quickly says no, then you have a good indication there's something there. Or if they say yes, you know, if they reflect and then say yes, then it's an opportunity, really a wonderful opportunity, to explore that. And um, what uh, I sometimes will do is, for example, if the child was falling, I'll, I'll hold the child or, or put my hand on the back of the child, an older child, and let them fall into my hand gradually and then to see what happens as they have this controlled fall. Because, again, you have your hands. They're, they're not going to fall. But they have the feeling, the sensations of falling. And so that may bring up images or sensations that were associated with the with the earlier event when they tumbled down a flight, of, I guess it was a flight of stairs. I guess that was just an assumption I made. But um, so in games, in play, in just talking, again, eleven-year-old, you were able to say again, um, you know, uh, 
remember a, a couple of years. What was it that happened a couple of years ago? Well, that and um, the stairs, that was, you know, a long time ago. But it, I know he remembers it because it's come up before uh, in conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, I would, again, make a game out of it, a falling game. And sometimes I'll, I'll do it, you know, just holding them with my hands, letting them slowly fall backwards, for example, or forward. You can do either one. And then I'll put a really big, super big pillow or combination of pillows, and then they can begin to I let them let them down part way, and then see if they want to play the game where you release them and they fall into the pillows. At first, they may be some fear you might see it in their eyes, or their heartbeat might increase. Uh, they might tense a little bit, but usually when you continue with this control fa- falling and the falling into the soft cushions. The kids love it. And, you know, and very often it's, o- it's something simple like that, which is all that's needed. Something simple like that. So where, where would it come in, for instance, just using my son as an example, um, let's play a game, let's, let's do this thing, and, um, and let's say I notice something in him, where, do, where would it come in to, to ask him or to invite him to name the qualities of sensation that he's feeling well, within him? Well, again, if you're talking, I, you know, I wonder if you remember the tumble you took down the stairs uh, when you were really little, when you were about two years old. And if the child says yes, then you can, then the sensations are going to be right there. If they're not remembering it, you can say, well, when you just even think about that, think about how it might have been for you, is there any place in your body can, that you can actually feel that? And again, most, most children will point to some part of their body. And then you take it to the next step. Okay. And then... And you feel that sensation. Does it have a shape? Does it have a size? Does it have a color? What does it feel like? And so forth. You start asking these what I call open-ended questions. And what is it about naming those sensations that's so important? Well, of course, the most important thing, of course, is feeling the sensations, being in contact with the sensations. Mm. But naming them is is also in, important uh, because that's a way that the child can reference them in the future. It's kind of like a flag at- attached to the sensation. Oh, okay, this sensation has a name. The next time I have this sensation, I have a name. And when I have the name, I can also notice the sensation. So you're kind of shifting back and forth. Yeah, and that reminds me of how important it is for all of us, really, to have the experience of moving through, which is part of what contributes to resiliency, right, Is, is knowing that the pendulum swings the other way. That's um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I call that pendulation. Right. Uh, because no matter what we're feeling, what we tend to do when there's been a difficult sensation mm-hmm. is we recoil from it. We try to push it away. And by pushing it away, it actually makes it seem stronger. That which we resist persists. So if you have a sensation that's coming up, imagine uh, your, your hand moving upwards and, and your, your hand is in a fist, your arm moving upwards. And you take the other hand and you put it over that hand that wants to move up. Well, then it's going to push harder against your, hand, your upper hand and then your upper hand is going to push harder against it. And so it then seems like this is going to be overwhelming and we lose resilience. 
However, when we're able to experience the sensation and that it moves through, that it increases and it decreases, that it contracts and it expands, it contracts and expands and expands and expands. And this is the expansion, which I talk about when I say goodness or wholeness. And again, I think it's very deeply uh, related to to resilience. I mean, I think we're talking about many, many, many of these different states and processes that increase resilience. So, when uh, when a child is is able to get related to that inner sensation and. And I think this is true for adults as well, that when we're sitting with our partner and able to say, okay, like right now I'm feeling this, this constriction in my chest and this heat in the palms of my hands and my, and I, you know, there's tension behind my eyes. Like I almost want to cry when you can get really related to that sensation, then you can, which sensation, the sensation of. To all of those, I guess, like this, okay. those, those things that are happening in your body. Yes. Like one, just like you were saying earlier, they, when you feel those states again, it can, it can remind you like, oh, I've been here before and, and I kind of know what's going on. So there's mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. But then yep. there's also, and you talk about this in, in terms of pendulation, if you're, ex, if you can get acquainted with the, sensations of goodness and what that feels like in your body as well that's right then that really connects you with that full range of of experience and how you move from one to the other when you experience goodness it stays with you and it really helps you get that whatever you're feeling whatever these sensations are they will change But the bigger reservoir of goodness we have, the more resilient. You know, a study was done. Oh, gosh, I don't remember by whom or when. Um, I think Bessel told me about it, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, that if a person, a child, has had tremendous trauma in their lives, neglect and abuse, that child will actually fare okay. Will be, in other words, will be, you'll be able to work with that person if one adult in their lives have cared about them and loved them unconditionally. I mean, that's in a way that's amazing. Yeah, you know. And so, again, I think that's something that contributes to that reservoir of goodness and resilience that somebody really reflected our feelings and our states and, and imparted upon us that gift of being seen, of being known, of being cared for, of, of being loved. It's very important. And, you know, again, most people that you see have had at least one encounter with that reservoir of goodness. And so sometimes actually with adults, but possibly also with children, to, um, to remember together that person and when you remember that person, how does it sense in your body? How does it feel in your body when you see the picture of grandma and how she would, uh, when you were sick, she would come and, 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 you know, and put her hand on your forehead and reassure you. Um, yeah, these, are, these are valuable. These are lodestars that help us return to our own capacity for resilience and and wholeness. One thing that strikes me too is that that is why relationship can be so profoundly healing and 
allow people to reach new levels of their own thriving in life is if you're able to find that in partnership where your partner is willing to see you unconditionally and hold space for you and 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 accept you in your vulnerable moments, then that allows your system to do what it needs to do to evolve past the the things that are holding you back. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, unconditional love is not necessarily a given. (laughs) That's true. Hopefully it's a given between the uh, parent and the child. Um, But I think, I think that just being sufficiently centered and caring can catalyze healing. I don't think there's any question about that. And I think it's really important that couples sort of work out a a ritual of sorts where if one person needs something, that they can communicate that and then the other person their their job is to try to be there for the person and it should be relatively equal you know each person should have a relative number of things although you know uh, particularly i'm thinking about uh, couples where one of the 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 spouses uh you know is coming back from afghanistan or iraq they're very very traumatized and it's very likely that they're and hopefully that their spouse, their partner, is going to be able to be there for them in those difficult times. Uh, And I can't tell you how healing that is. It's not easy because a lot of times, because of the fear, the the spouse becomes uh, like the enemy. Mm. It's almost like you're expecting them to throw a hand grenade at you. So it's tricky. And, you know, if people want, uh, they can go to, uh, it's a YouTube, and it's called Ray's Story, R-A-Y, Ray's Story, Peter Levine, Somatic Experiencing, where I work with a a young Marine who was blown up by two of these IEDs and then lost, I think his best friend died in his arms just before that, and how we work with the shock of that, and then how uh, we work together with he and his wife and their new child. Um, and at that t- at that time, it was really um, helping her develop the skills to be with him and to not pursue him when he, you know, when he really needed to withdraw. And I think it's 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 a short documentary. It's about twenty minutes uh and i I recommend looking at it because it really talks a lot about this you know because when you're highly traumatized your resilience is very very low uh and vice versa when your resilience is higher the trauma has less of a corrosive effect uh but then again i think it's also important that there be some kind of equality that what, what I guess I guess I'm saying that one person doesn't become the therapist for the other person that right. there's reciprocity which you have to have in a relationship of course yeah i have some faith in the pendulation in relationship as well where you know it, that may not have that reciprocity may not have to all be at the same time that most likely if one partner is having their moment where they really need to be attended to, um, the other partner will have their moment <laughs> at some point down yes, the road. You know, can pretty well be assured of that. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, when people aren't coming back from war zones, and I think the fact that you, that your work is, is uh, so helpful for people who are suffering such, severe trauma that's like a testament to just how powerful your work is and at the same time um when you're in a state when you're when you're hijacked and kind of triggered by your emotions and whatever's happening with your partner you're gonna feel like your partner's out to get you i think that Mm -hmm. one of the biggest things for partners to realize is to feel is is to 
establish like, oh, I'm actually safe with you. Like right. you're not you're not out to get me <laughs> or get something from me. And sometimes yeah. there's some uh, reckoning that has to happen for that to actually be true. Um, indeed, for people indeed, to indeed, yeah. renegotiate how they even come together in partnership. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and again, the idea of making a, a ritual out of it. And because of pendulation, no matter what we're feeling, it may transiently, it may temporarily feel worse. But if you're able to stay with it and maintain a observing presence, it will shift. And often this observing presence is fostered by the support that we get from our, from our uh, partners. Yeah, can we talk for a moment about what that looks like? Because I think there's a a danger in being the the witness, whether it's with your partner or with your kids, of maybe intervening too soon. Uh -huh. um, so what does that process uh, actually look like where something stuck gets resolved? Hmm. Well, you know, I think... You know, again, very often some something. Let's just say it's a, a, a heterosexual couple. The husband comes in and he's had a difficult day at work. It's not a trauma, per se, but he's he failed to get a promotion. The other person got the promotion who he felt didn't deserve it, uh, and he's really angry. And he comes home, and there are toys scattered all over. The floor, no different than any other day when he would be returning home. And he's angry and he yells at the kids, you know, damn it, pick these toys up. You always leave toys in the middle of the room or something like that. And let's say the spouse is able to maintain her center and then she can approach her husband and say, yeah, it seems like something's upsetting you. And I'd like to just offer myself of just being here so that you can feel what you're feeling. But again, this has to be a, a pre-agreed upon ritual that you you give the permission, you empower the other person to do this, to do this for you. Uh, you know, again, because when you're angry, sometimes the tendency is to snap at the other person you know, at the partner, not just the kids, but the partner. And so, again, we have to find a way that we have some some rules and regulations built into it. Yeah, I like a code word sometimes at, you know, at a time mm -hmm. like that. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, okay, or leave me alone right now. Right, and I like, was thinking more like something even kind of like one, one partner comes in and says, this is a... Uh, this is a, uh, I'm just going to make something up here. This is a Oriole moment, or this is a Blue Jay moment, you know, where, or we're in code cardinal, you know, for red. Oh, I see. Yeah, <laughs> you I know, don't know and what an Oriole moment is, but. <laughs> right, just a way, like some, some prearranged designation so that mm -hmm. the partner doesn't have to say, wow, you seem really triggered right now, you know, or. Uh, got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, if I okay, can say co code good cardinal, idea. then the yeah. other part, I would love to hold space for you right now. I would love to, to just it, I, hear what's going on with you. Yeah. Then yeah. It takes a right. little can bit of the I edge just be off. There? Can I just be there with you? Yeah. Yeah. No, code word is a good idea because each person probably knows what word is most likely to work for them and, and, and not be reactive to it. Good point. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's an idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I know some couples, you know, when they're, the other couple is really like anxious and getting ready to, in their perception to snap at them. You know, uh, I've had couples to just say eggshells. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and often they, they, you know, they'll laugh together, but not always. You know that you're 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 concern you're concerned you're noticing that you're walking on eggshells, so maybe that's a useful. But anyhow, let the people the person pick their own. That's the one that's more likely to work. And it, nothing's going to work all the time. That's another given. There are times when it won't work, and you don't want to be discouraged by that. You know that's just the nature 
of resilience. Resilience, of, of building resilience, building resistance. It doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't always seem to happen, you know, increase, 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 because sometimes you're feeling more resilient and then something happens and it feels like you're less resilient. But the overall movement is towards greater resilience. Again, I think that's just part of how we are built. That's part of our evolutionary advantage is to have this kind of resilience right and yet so often it doesn't happen you know people people do get stuck in trauma or couples get stuck in a pattern of how they interact with each other um so i'm curious getting back to our example of the you know the husband who comes home the partner says you know could i you know could i hold some space for you um what What's likely to happen next? Well, let's say a, a favorable outcome, which I've seen many times. The Again, let's just say it's the husband, it's a heterosexual couple, the husband's coming home. And he's, he's obviously activated. Um, just by being there and being present, and saying, you know, I'm here, saying it verbally and non-verbally, I am here, I am here for you. I, often the tears will just start flowing from the spouse's eye, from the husband's eyes. Tears of relief and tears of gratitude. And that's another part that's really important in resilience is the N- not the belief in gratitude, but the inner experience of gratefulness, of gratitude. Um, so, again, that's something that we can cultivate together because it's really what we want. We don't want to be angry and withdraw and isolate ourselves and become more angry. We want to be able to move through it. And, you know, and if people are in, in a relationship, they're committed to a passionate relationship, if you are committed to that, then you have to be able to work with these difficult emotions. Otherwise, there won't be the passion. The passion will die as these emotions get more and more suppressed. Yeah. So I think if people are committed to a passionate relationship, then they also are committed to uh, to uh, being there for each other with these difficult emotions. So tears are normal to experience? Tears. Even sometimes you'll see shaking and trembling and spontaneous breaths. Sometimes they'll be even, of course, sobbing. Uh, And, you know, when they're sobbing, uh, or even when there's just the tears, very often if the spouse or the partner says, can I hold you? Or I'd like to hold you. And they give some kind of a nonverbal cue that it's okay. Just holding the person when they're in that emotional pain. God, how liberating that can be Mm. to be literally held. Right. And this is really challenging because because sometimes when your partner is in pain, it's hard. It's hard to know, like to know what am I supposed to do in this moment? So, um, being willing to make an offer like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now how would some how would I know if I'm holding space for my partner and they're crying and shaking? Like how do I know if everything's okay versus like things are not okay? Um well, you know, I think again no matter what the emotion is, if you're helping to hold the space including holding the person. And, you know, and I'll use the, uh, put, put in a question like, or a statement like this. I'd like to hold you, just nod if that's okay. So they don't have to think, you could say, well, is it okay if I could hold you now? Well, then the person has to start thinking about it, which takes them out of the feeling. Mm. But if you're able to do something like, you know, that, that I just described, you know, <laughs> I really would like to hold you. If, if that's okay, just nod or just look at me for a moment. And so then to be held, because almost 
all of us who have been traumatized have not been held in those critical times mm. when we should have been held. But it's never too late to have a resilient childhood. It's never too late to have a happy child because the child not only lives within us, but that child's ability to rebound, to be resilient also lives within us. Yeah, um, and I'm wondering, what does it look like? Like, how do these things, how would it typically resolve? So, because I think one thing that a lot of us can be can feel a lot of fear going into tears and and I'm I want to to offer this because if you're listening to this show and you're maybe you're thinking like oh god I got some tears to shed or um like I want you to have a sense of that there is another side like what does it look through when you get through the tears what does it look through like if you feel yourself starting to shake what's on the other side of that and how do you know when you're getting there yeah you know Again, almost any sensation where the person, it's in a safe enough situation and the person is able to stand back enough to observe them, I, I can barely ever think of a sensation that didn't become more good, more glad, more... whole mm. I mean that's it's just our nature and it's a skill you have to practice it doesn't happen all at once so couples shouldn't feel frustrated if it doesn't work at once and you know and if the the uh, spouse that's in the distress you know barks at you you know just to remind to feel your own body of course and remind yourself that you're not the target that they're angry at somebody else. And then again, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the partner will say something like, maybe it seems like you just want to be alone right now. And, you know, I'll be, if you need me, I'm avail I'm here. And um, so let's just talk a little bit later. Because again, a lot of times, and again, this is, I know this is like stereotypic, but, uh, but it's also true. A lot of times the men don't want to deal with it then. They, we need some more time just to be with ourselves and then we can reach out for support and help. You know, I mean, it would be great if that didn't, if it didn't happen that way, that we we're always open to support, but we're not. We're not. So we need also to acknowledge and respect that. Right. Right. And, and, and again, to know, because, you know, if you have, as you, relationship grows and as trust continues as trust continues uh, those skills really build and I've seen clients you know where they're just really angry at each other in one moment and then boom they're in love with each other again and again and again so it does take practice it does take appreciating that nothing's going to happen perfectly Not, nothing's going to happen all at once that it's a gradual process of deepening as relationships are about deepening the connection and deepening our skill to be with ourselves and to be with the other in the um in the how to trauma proof your kids book trauma proofing your kids you talk about offering children the opportunity to tell the story yeah. of what happened. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, that's usually after you've gone through first the bodily reactions. Yes. The, the crying, the shaking, the trembling, the spontaneous breaths, and leaving time for that to settle. And then, you know, I know a number of parents have told me, say that happens like before, just before dinner. Well, then they'll have the family dinner together and then afterwards to sit by the child and, <coughs> excuse me, and say, wow, you know, <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you fell off your bicycle, that really scared me. Um, 
I, I bet it really scared you. Do you remember? Do you remember what it was like to fall off? And then the child, if they want, can, you know, can then start talking about the content, of how scary it was, about how they couldn't get their breath, but then they could get their breath when they were crying just then. You know, um, yeah, yeah, it's, fi- it's fine to talk about it, but, but again, to at least separate it in time with moving through the shock part of it and moving in towards the more um, beneficial sensations, more supportive sensations. Right. So you've moved from shock, maybe even numbness, into um, really tuning into the bodily sensation and and you know the things that are uncomfortable in a moment. And, and by being right. and by being there, it, it it initiates the the process. I think this is what you were talking about. That by attending to that sensation. There's a there's a natural mechanism at work that invites it to evolve to a place of release, which is going to feel good in yeah, the yeah. end. We were always, always open, almost always, always open to release, given an adequate amount of support. Right. What I loved, too, is you talked about the importance of time in between questions so when you're asking like mm-hmm. what are you sensing or what comes next yeah to just create leave space there that's right yes that's right adults tend to be you know linear time this then that then that then this then that then this then that like along a straight trajectory kids don't do that they're much more with what the aboriginal people call, so-called aboriginal people, call circular time. And children are like that, right? They get up in the morning, they have their breakfast, they go to school, they come back, they have milk and cookies, milk and Oreos, they go out and play, the parents call them for dinner, they come in, they eat, they play, they go to sleep, they wake up, they get dressed, they have breakfast, they go <laughs> off to school, they come. See, it's, it's, it's a very different relationship to time. <laughs> it's a much more, uh, it's a much more right-brained mm. uh, way of, of, of relating to time. So, yes, parents, uh, adults will often tend to rush things when you need pauses, and the children will give you clues about that. You know, in the in one of the case examples I give, or the, the examples I give in uh, tra- uh, not trauma and uh, in uh, trauma proofing your kids, uh, is a play where the, with Sammy who who had a fall, had his cracked his his you know had to go to the the emergency room for stitches and so forth, and then we were playing the game of rescuing Pooh Bear. Pooh Bear was in the hospital. Um, Each time he would give us very clear signals of what he needed then. And our children give us these cues if we're paying attention. And in order to pay attention, we have to be able to be relatively comfortable within ourselves. And again, this is something that then the, the parents can practice with each other. And it just spreads to the child. And it spreads to the child's playmates. And it spreads to the whole <laughs> village, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> um, Peter, you've been so generous with your time and, and your wisdom as before. I have one more question for you, if you don't mind, that that just sprang in with what you just said, um, which is, I, well, for one thing, I'm impressed by your faith in our ability to to heal, to get to a, a place of goodness and wholeness. And what you said about the children, that they, they can communicate to us exactly what they need yeah. if we're willing to pay attention and offer space. And I'm thinking as an adult, how do we recognize the signs within ourselves of what we need? 
mm. in a given moment. Well, that takes practice because, again, when we're in a scary or a vulnerable mo- moment, you know, our early pattern may be to withdraw. But again, we can unlearn that and learn new ones. When you talk about faith, well, I mean, I guess I could kind of relate to that. I can relate to that. But it's also 45 years of experience and seeing this happen thousands of times. Yes. You know, and so I, I guess I know, I know it, I know it <laughs> because of experience, I guess if you want to call that faith, okay, we could call it faith, but it's, it's just, you know, the human being never ceases to amaze me. You know, I think we're all like this meadow of different colored flowers, and they were all moving from our roots to our stems, to the flower, to the bud, to the flower, and opening and opening and opening. And I, I think opening is a basic human need, a basic human drive. Um, there's a, uh, I think Annis Nen said something like this, when the pain of tightening into a bud becomes more than the pain of opening as a flower, then we will open. And there's some truth to that, of course. But I don't think it's just pain that brings us towards opening. I think it's just this innate capacity, the desire to open, to be fully alive, to be able to say, I'm alive, I'm here, I'm real, I'm here, I'm alive and I'm real, I'm alive and I'm here. That's what everyone wants. That's, again, I, faith, no, it's observation. I mean, you know, I was trained as a scientist, and a lot of that is about observation. Yogi Berra said it this way, you can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that. And again, in, in the book, we give you know numbers of different exercises for the parents to help them get more in contact with their inner sensations and um, and their own resilience. And well, and I would like to um, to also, you know, following on your metaphor, I would love for this conversation to plant the seed that pain isn't required to get you to this place of blossoming, that yeah. that knowing that it's possible to blossom mm-hmm. will hopefully help you invite your partner, invite your children, invite yourself into that experience. Exactamente, as they say in Brazil. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. Your books, Trauma Proofing Your Kids, Trauma and Memory, Healing Trauma, Waking the Tiger, so many classics that are, are just completely inspiring, both on the level of recognizing what's possible, and but also mm-hmm. understanding what is happening within us and in the mm-hmm. world around us. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just, it's such an honor to be able to talk to you and to share your work with the world. Um, as a reminder, if you uh, want the show guide and transcript for today's episode, you can visit neilsatin.com slash Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, as in Peter Levine. Um, you can also text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And we will have links as well to Peter's work, to his books. Um, Peter, what, it, what do you think is the best way for people to, to find out more about what you're doing in the world? Is there a particular website you'd like them to visit? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's the, the website of my uh, training institute. It's, it's uh, www.traumahealing.com. Dot org trauma healing one word dot org and their lists of therapists and you can find that for example therapists that specialize with children or, or in relate with relationships uh, and then I have a website uh, with you know different information of where I might be giving a public 
uh, lecture or something like that or some videos that are available. And that's uh, uh, www.somaticexperiencing, one word, somaticexperiencing.com or .org, I think. Um, so, yeah, they can uh, get material there. And apparently, although I've never seen them, people tell me there are a number of uh, interviews or lectures that are uh, available on YouTube. So I guess if you just YouTube my Peter A. Levine, uh, it'll come up with a, a, a bunch of stuff. Great, great. And I think and it was delightful to talk with you again, Neil, really. And I so much appreciate what you're doing because really uh, we are are designed to be in relationship and to keep our relationships alive. That's the real task. It sure is for me. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you. And and your work has been so helpful uh, in my life. And I know the thousands upon thousands of listeners who listen to our first conversation together. So um, really exciting to talk to you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.